Greetings from Washington, D.C., the city of politics and uh, more politics and a lousy baseball team and football team and Congress for that matter. Look, I apologize I can't be there in person to participate today. I, along with 435 of my closest friends, are in the midst of debating the fate of our health care. The fact that this bill has yet to be filed certainly won't stop us from voting on it. After all, there, there is precedent. That is why I signed a pledge not to vote for a health care bill I haven't fully read. And you thought going through war and peace was bad. Well, this is longer, and there's absolutely no plot. Now, this may seem hard to believe, but over 200 years ago, the Founding Fathers foresaw the health care problems we have today, and they proposed a solution. We call it federalism. See, if, if something has to be done the same way at the same time by everybody, only the federal government can do it. The feds are good at one-size-fits-all solutions. But if you want creativity and innovation and justice and consideration for unique circumstances, the states are, as Louis Brandeis once said, the true laboratories of democracy. The Founding Fathers understood the federal government should be limited not just for the fun of it, but the federal government has limitations to its effectiveness. In the Federalist Paper, James Madison said power delegated to the federal government are few and defined. Those to the state governments are numerous and indefinite. And why? Well, because states can be more effective than a large national government. Federal government can't and shouldn't try to solve all our problems, even when the intention may be good. A Supreme Court Justice once wrote, the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. It divides power precisely so that we can resist the temptation to create power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day. He wasn't speaking about health care reform specifically, but if there ever was a bill that sought to concentrate power as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day, it's the Pelosi health care bill. If we were to pass it, we would be losing sight of the structure the founders put in place to ensure reforms were done at the most appropriate and helpful level and that power wasn't concentrated. Balance is the key. The Pelosi bill would be a permanent shift of power to the federal government to control our lives and our health care decisions. Our health care system needs reform and costs need to be lowered. But the reforms needed for the state of California are not the same reforms that would be needed for the state of Massachusetts or the state of Utah. Massachusetts has their own program. It's expensive, but they appear to like it. But it won't work in Utah. And what Utah is trying to do won't fly in Boston. Like every state, Utah's demographics are unique. We have a very young population that predominantly works for smaller firms. In, in Utah, 32% of small businesses offer insurance, but that's 10% less than the national averages. It's a unique challenge to Utah. Utah needs reform that will take the burden off small business and give compatible, affordable pricing to consumers. And that's why I am so encouraged about the reforms that are taking place in Utah. The changes taking place right now in our state are based on consumer choice, options, businesses having stable cost, workers having affordable, portable options, and it's tailored for our demographics. If the Pelosi bill were to pass, though, that state innovation is stopped. And that, to me, would be a true health care tragedy. You know, you can't solve every issue by getting all the experts in a room in D.C. All the creativity and intelligence is not just here in this city. Creative solutions can happen throughout this country when the federal government gets off the backs of individuals and businesses with their mandates and regulations and out of their pockets with their taxes and then allows real people the ability to find real solutions. The Pelosi bill will seek to dramatically alter health care landscape for Utah and the U.S. forever. Uh, for example, page 94 prohibits the sale of private health insurance this beginning in 2013. In what used to be page 49, it provides a huge loophole for uh, large insurance companies that I bet no more than 10 people know about. Small businesses will have a mandate to provide insurance or pay a penalty. It is estimated that 5,500 small businesses in Utah will be hit with this additional tax. That's a devastating for small business owners who are already sick and tired of being nickeled and dimed by the federal government. Tort reform, allowing interstate insurance competition, block grants to states with high risk pooling, these are things the federal government could do to drive down costs, but they're not in the Pelosi bill. Those are the things the citizens do in fact need. Individual merits of this bill notwithstanding, the biggest problem is that the idea that health care decisions can be dictated by a Washington, D.C. bureaucrat, a health care czar, are, well, to phrase P.J. O'Rourke, or to paraphrase P.J. O'Rourke, it would have the same effect as giving alcohol and keys to the car to a teenage boy. The federal government can play a role, but real health care reforms must happen on the state level. You and I know what our unique health care needs are and, frankly, what types of treatment and access we need. 
Despite the rhetoric coming from both sides of the aisle, our ability to choose will be lost if we fail to allow individual states to address their unique and diverse needs. Hey, I thank you for listening to me. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Just thank you for allowing me to be with you here today.